Now, we are the Neanderthal. 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 Wow, wow, wow. Wow. <laughs> I guess I'll start with the most basic thing. You can pronounce it either way. Tall is a German word for valley, but it used to be spelled with an H. English speakers have ignored that silent H for over a century now, so it's technically fine to say Thal. But I guess I should probably help break that tradition. My name is Riley Harnett, and this is The Heap. So you want to know about Neanderthals? Well, I think you've come to the right place. This video is as comprehensive as I can be without it going too long and it should set you up well to understand anything you might see or read about Neanderthals in the future. I'm also not going to tell you that pieces of evidence are unquestionably true and there are reasonable scientific doubts to be had. Everything I do is sourced, and it's my hope that this video makes it among the pantheon of scientifically accurate Neanderthal videos. So with that out of the way, let's begin. Neanderthals, or Homo neanderthalensis, are an extinct species of human, easily the most famous ones too. The first Neanderthal fossil was discovered in 1829, but was misidentified as being part of our species, Homo sapiens. In 1856, a different discovery would lead to Neanderthals being recognized as their own unique species. This find, the aptly named Neanderthal I, was considered by many as Homo sapiens II. But anatomist William King wasn't convinced. At a conference in 1863, King named it Homo neanderthalensis. And a year later, he published his rationale, saying, On the whole, there is a remarkable absence of those contours and proportions which prevail in the forehead of our species. And few can refuse to admit that the deficiency more closely approximates the Neanderthal fossil to the anthropoid apes than to Homo sapiens. King had little more to work with than a skullcap, and thought Neanderthals must have been pretty dumb. The brutish idiot has been a Neanderthal stereotype ever since. We found a lot more Neanderthal bones, and learned a bunch in the last 150 years. So let's start with our physical differences. Like us, Neanderthals vary from individual to individual. This means that not all Neanderthals share the same suite of traits. Generally speaking, there are a number of easy-to-see traits that we consider indicative of Neanderthals. Most of them lie in the skull. I imagine the first thing that might take your notice is the thick brow ridge. Neanderthals had a broad nose and eye sockets that speak to very large eyes. Our chin has a bony growth that sticks forward. Neanderthals generally don't have that and are similar to other species of Homo in that regard. They have a taller face and a forehead that slopes backward, and their face from nose to ear is also longer. Compared to our skull, see how the back of theirs keeps going? This area is known as the occipital bund, and it's shaped that way on the inside too. This tells us that the corresponding section of brain, the occipital lobe, is therefore very large in Neanderthals. This area concerns itself with vision, and considering the size of Neanderthal eyes, some aspect of their vision was clearly more developed than ours. In fact, on average, Neanderthals had larger brains than modern humans do. That doesn't mean they're more intelligent, though. Intelligence is a really complicated thing, and this video is about the basics. Below the skull, Neanderthals are what scientists call robust. This means that their bones are thicker, and we can tell that Neanderthals carried a lot of muscle. They're generally pretty stocky, or shorter limbs. Interestingly, the lower segments of Neanderthal rib cages were wider, which might indicate larger lungs, and therefore an increased breathing capacity. The oldest Neanderthal we've discovered dates to roughly 430,000 years ago. It was found in northern Spain, and Europe was covered with these folk. We've got Neanderthal remains as far east as Siberia, and as far south as Palestine too, so a considerably large range. Neanderthals and Homo sapiens existed at the same time, and occasionally in the same geographic area, but determining when and where their common ancestor existed is tricky. 
Genetics currently approximates the common ancestor of both groups at roughly 503 to 565,000 years ago. Keep in mind that this is an estimate. There are a number of assumptions we need to plug in. For example, we don't know the average age of Neanderthal parents, so we need to assume the age of a generation. One study has already put this date into question. See, if Neanderthals and Sapiens diverged at the time genetics suggests, the teeth of those oldest Neanderthals would have had to evolve very quickly, much more quickly than we'd expect. This dental analysis figures our common ancestor lived between 800,000 and 1.2 million years ago. Unfortunately, the fossil record doesn't help clarify the origins of Neanderthals either. Of the many fossils we've discovered from this time range, not one of them has come with a textbook explaining their evolutionary relationships to one another. There's a good few fossils that we can't quite classify into specific species, and as a result, the relationships between them are difficult to determine. Science is still trying to work this out. But next up, we have a topic that science has already figured out. So that's nice. Neanderthals definitely 100% interacted with humans. No ifs, no buts. Definitely happened. Feels real good to say when your niche is human evolution, let me tell you. The earliest interactions between Neanderthals and modern humans likely happened in and around Israel. In that area we've got Neanderthals, we've got Sapiens. We've got fossils that look partially Neanderthal and partially Sapiens. The population dynamics in this part of the world during the time of the Neanderthals isn't terribly clear, but I think it's safe to say that there was interaction, potentially over a long time frame. Things get a bit easier when we move to Europe. Remains found in Chechia are thought to be 45,000 years old, but through genetics we know that this individual didn't give rise to modern Europeans, and is suggestive of an early failed migration attempt. Homo sapiens were in Italy at least 43 to 45,000 years ago, and Neanderthals appear to have gone extinct between 40.8 and 39.2 thousand years ago. This means we're looking at 2,000 years of cohabitation at minimum. You might already know this next fun fact because it made lots of headlines in the science community over the last decade. Neanderthals and Homo sapiens interbred somewhere outside of Africa. It's not known when or where or how many times this occurred, but we're sure it did from a comparison of our genomes. Those Neanderthal genes still exist in people worldwide today, about 2% outside of Africa. It's a common misconception that there are no Neanderthal genes in Sub-Saharan Africans. There's not as much, about 0.6%. Most of this is explained by our ancestors with Neanderthal DNA migrating back into Africa and spreading that DNA among African populations across the last 50,000 years. Figuring out what that DNA actually does is pretty tricky. Lots of it does absolutely nothing and there's easily decades of work ahead of us to better understand this Neanderthal contribution. That's not to say we haven't found anything though. We absolutely have. For example, some people inherited genes from Neanderthals that affect our immune system. This potentially helped our ancestors survive the diseases outside of Africa. Oh, and just because we have Neanderthal DNA doesn't mean we're the same species. Classifying species isn't something that nature intends. It's just the easiest system we have to better communicate evolution. The Neanderthals represent a lineage of people that acted in ways similar to our own species more often than we give them credit for. But Neanderthals also did things their own way. Even though some of their DNA lives in us, their unique way of life has been gone for a long time. They're extinct. But understanding Neanderthals gives context to appreciating how our own ancestors took over the planet. They're an important part of our story. Being extinct, it's difficult to figure out exactly how smart Neanderthals were. Most of what we have to work with is bones, and bones don't often tell that story. Luckily, Neanderthals were kind enough to drop us some hints that they're not the mindless brutes we used to think they were. Everything I've included in this section predates the arrival of modern humans in Europe. So if anyone tells you that a modern human taught Neanderthals the things we see in the archaeological record, 
don't believe them. We found loads of stone tools associated with Neanderthals, and they even developed their own way of doing things. This is known as the Mysterian tool industry, and it's a significant innovation from the way that things were done before. Neanderthals also used spears as weapons, and it's entirely possible they were made to be thrown. Projectile weaponry is first evidenced in Homo sapiens, so the possibility that Neanderthals were throwing spears 300,000 years ago is real. While we have no direct, undisputable evidence, it's accepted that Neanderthals would have required clothing of some sort to survive the ice ages in which they lived. This could have been achieved in the form of wrapping skins around oneself, and doesn't necessarily require tailoring. But Neanderthals also made fibers out of plant material. These fibers don't preserve very well, so it's difficult to tell exactly how they were used. The technique in which the fiber was made could have been used to produce ropes, or even fabric. If you're making fabric, there's a chance you're making clothes. The oldest evidence we have for clothing manufacturing is as much as 120,000 years ago in Morocco. But being Morocco, it's presumed that it was Homo sapiens that's responsible. Nonetheless, logic follows that if clothing was required in Morocco, then it was required further north as well. We also see interesting hints that Neanderthals may have been using boats. Stone tools have been discovered on the island of Crete in the Mediterranean, dating to at least 107,000 years ago. Crete has been an island for at least 5 million years, so it follows that whoever made it there to lose their tools came from Europe, and presumably the only folks in Europe at the time were the Neanderthals. The link to Neanderthals is admittedly circumstantial evidence. Everything else about the find is solid. These stone tools were even made on Crete, so whoever is responsible clearly had the ability to cross large bodies of water. If we ever happen to find stronger evidence of Neanderthals on Crete, you shouldn't be surprised. Now that you have a good enough idea of what Neanderthals were technologically capable of, let me give you a look into how behaviorally capable they were. Neanderthals created art. Yes, art. That uniquely human thing. Cave art in Spain is at least 64.8 thousand years old. This predates our occupation of Europe by about 20,000 years which leaves only the Neanderthals to blame. No one can tell you what meaning this piece of art had to the people who created it, but that doesn't change the fact that it was, in some way, meaningful. That's not all the art we've got. Neanderthals also painted marine shells. These shells had holes in them, and that's got to make you wonder if they were at some point part of a necklace or bracelet. I could go on all day about Neanderthal art. There's a bunch of evidence, and bunches of disputed evidence that's nonetheless super interesting. But I've got to keep this video short and punchy, so let's move on. In the animal kingdom, you need your body to work for you. If you break a bone, you're likely to die before it ever heals. In Neanderthals, we see many cases of bones healing, and individuals living into their old age with a number of bodily issues, sometimes painful and debilitating ones. This speaks to a level of cooperation in Neanderthal society that healthy members would provide the necessities of life to wounded or elderly members who could not do so by themselves. One of the most extreme examples of this can be seen in a Neanderthal from Shanidar Cave in Iraq. This man lost his right forearm and hand, had taken a blow to the head that probably caused at least some vision loss in his left eye, he was likely deaf in his right ear and partially deaf in his left, he had suffered damage to his right knee and foot that left him with a limp, and likely experienced a number of degenerative diseases that would have affected him in other negative ways. Nonetheless, he lived like that, and he couldn't have done it alone. It used to be thought that Neanderthals lived more dangerous lives than our ancestors at the time, but it turns out that the rate of injuries seen in Neanderthal remains is about equal to ours. Another Shanidar cave Neanderthal was thought to have been buried with flowers, which would demonstrate that Neanderthals were not only disposing of their dead for practical reasons, but were attaching symbolic meaning to the act. The evidence for this is pretty loose, and the flowers could have gotten there in a number of ways. My personal favorite explanation is that a local species of rodent, the Persian jurd, had dug a tunnel directly above this Neanderthal and banked flowers there to eat later. 
Rodent tunnels were noticed near the skeletons in the cave, and this animal has a history of storing flowers in its burrow, so it's actually fairly likely. Nonetheless, there are a good number of Neanderthal remains that are very well preserved. Being buried aids preservation quite a lot, so it's entirely likely that burials of some form were being performed. This is generally accepted by the scientific community, but there are a few dissidents who want more evidence to be sure. This is one of those topics that are deep enough in their own right to warrant an entire episode. Neanderthals have a hyoid bone that's very similar to ours. This bone floats in your throat, and it's where a number of different things that are necessary for speech attach. This includes your tongue and larynx. You know, the voice box. If Neanderthals had a differently shaped hyoid, we might have some reason to suggest that they couldn't talk. But that's not the case, so the possibility still exists. They also have the same variation of the FOXP2 gene. We know this gene is important for communication because if you have a problematic mutation on it, you have problems speaking and understanding speech. So again, another potential smoking gun that turned out to be unloaded. Nothing here suggests Neanderthals couldn't speak either. Finally, the shape of the inner ear bones in Neanderthals is different than ours, and this could potentially impact their ability to understand speech as we do. But despite the difference in shape, they appear to function in the same ways. And again, we have no reason to believe that they couldn't understand speech. So we don't have any evidence to suggest Neanderthals weren't speaking, but we also don't have anything concrete to suggest they were. Language isn't a purely biological thing. You still have to be taught to converse. This is one of the biggest mysteries of Neanderthals, and the conclusive proof that they had language is going to take a long time, if it's even possible at all. Where they're extinct, if you want to talk to a Neanderthal, you're going to need a time machine. Which brings us to our final, heavy-hearted topic. But how? Why? If they were as capable as us, why are we here and they're not? Well, there are a lot of ideas on this, and I can't cover them all in this section. So let's run through a few of the more common ideas. First, some think Neanderthals are extinct because of us. Modern humans entered Europe to stay among the final days of the Neanderthals, and that's a pretty curious coincidence. Arguments have been made that we drove the Neanderthals to extinction either through war, disease, or outcompeting them for resources. Another school of thought believes that Neanderthals lived in small populations, and this would have put them at risk of adapting to problematic situations. Small populations are more likely to have difficulties finding healthy breeding partners, and we've seen evidence of interbreeding in Neanderthals. At times of stress, smaller groups are more risky. Losing a few individuals could have major consequences for the entire group. And a third school points a finger at environmental factors like climate change and volcanism. Just a complete wrong place, wrong time scenario. Neanderthal extinction might not be the result of a single issue. Any number of these ideas could have existed and contributed their fair share to Neanderthal extinction. I don't have any clear answers for you. But I did find a paper that asked 216 paleoanthropologists for what ideas they favored. The most highly favored explanation is the second one, that a thin population size caused a bunch of problems. Environmental factors also outscored modern humans outcompeting Neanderthals. The Neanderthals are extinct, but that legacy of interbreeding with us, and the possibility that their genes remain in us because they're useful, might mean that somehow, somewhere, Neanderthals helped us survive just a little better. I think that's a beautiful thing that we didn't appreciate until recently. The entirety of written history may have forgotten what these evolutionary brothers did for some of us. And worse, once we collectively rediscovered their existence in the 1800s, instead of giving them the credit they're due, we decide to see them as stupid, unevolved brutes with no true evidence to suggest so. We still call people Neanderthals as an insult. And doing so, we're refusing to acknowledge one of the more technologically advanced and deeply cultured animals that the planet has ever seen. These are who the Neanderthals were, and I sincerely hope that I've contributed to your understanding of them here today. Folks, this one took a lot of work to make. 
It's a daunting task to compress everything we know about an entire species into a short video like this. But the work doesn't end here. More videos to come. I've posted social media links in the description if you'd like to follow me. Otherwise, feel free to check out any of my other videos. Thanks for watching.